Hello, ladies and gentlemen of AP Government. Welcome back, uh, Mr. Shaw and... Mrs. Womack, coming at ya! She gets really mad when I call her Miss Womack. I don't really get it. No, I don't. Oh, I was sorry. just correcting your grammar. I don't think it's grammar. Whatever. Anyway, welcome back, guys. Uh, we're, today we're talking about the budget and the politics of taxing and spending, and it's as exciting as it sounds. <laughs> That doesn't sound very exciting. <laughs> Here are our learning objectives. Um, again, like you guys can, you don't need to copy them down. This is just what we're going to be dealing with. Uh, so go, we'll go ahead and keep going. All right, here's a vocabulary page. So you'll notice that before every section, we put this in for you. Some of these terms are a little bit difficult to understand, so we want you to kind of take a second, pause on these pages or these slides, make sure you understand these vocabulary terms so that you can follow as we are explaining each of these slides. Uh, I would go ahead and pause it right now. I would even write it down uh, just so you have them later. You guys can use them to help study. If you want to make flashcards, a quizlet, something like that, um, this would be definitely uh, a good place to start. There you go. All right. Federal revenue and borrowing. So first we need to talk about the 16th Amendment, which was passed in 1913, um, which allows Congress to collect an income tax. Remember, I teach my kids, you're 16 when you get your first job, therefore you're 16 when you start paying taxes. And it's the 16th Amendment. Apparently, Moving on. Apparently you're just better than me. A little bit. <laughs> Um, okay, it also, I believe it also allows the IRS. Uh, I'm not sure if they, I think they I don't think to, they, they talk they about it. that later. Okay, so anyway, there's an IRS, Internal Revenue Service, and this is kind of the agency that regulates um, and establishes taxation. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> it's going great so far. Uh-huh. Right? Yeah. Um, and so we do want to point out that we say that income taxes on individuals are progressive, meaning the more you make, the more taxes you pay. So it's like a percentage of taxes that you pay. It is not just a flat tax rate. Um, it's progressive. So people with higher incomes pay more taxes. Um, the current tax rate, depending on where you fall, um, income bracket, tax bracket wise, would be between 10% um, to almost 40%. So the highest, the rich, the richest people in America are going to be actually paying 40% of their income uh, to the government in taxes. And a lot of people think that that's unfair. Uh, but more people, again, on the other end, when you think about it, like if 10% of the people are or, I'm sorry, the lower lower end, 10% of your income is going to the government and you can barely, you know, afford to feed your family. Um, you know, that's that's a, a much different situation. So, a uh, little known fact, uh, 16th Amendment, there's a lot of controversy that it might have been illegally passed. Did you know that, Ms. Woman? I didn't know that. That's a yeah. fun fact. That is a fun fact. Uh, it's, a, it's a rumor, though. It's more like conspiracy than anything else. Uh, but the government needed money, and uh, so they, they went ahead and passed. There had actually been some court cases that had declared income taxes uh, unconstitutional, so they added it to the Constitution. Interesting. Um, also, if you look at most of the other developed countries in the world, we actually have the lowest of the tax rates. Wow. Well. In most other countries. Well, that makes sense because they don't. We're more more people in America don't want that. Right. The government we always taking, think taxes are bad. Right. Blech. Don't tread on me. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh your turn. Okay. Great. Uh, so who pays taxes? What you guys need to know is 40, 45 percent of people pay zero taxes. But why? Well, you know what? What you're going to notice is that there's some people who there's certain tax loopholes, certain uh, criteria that people meet. Um, for example, if you maybe are not or in the lowest percentage of people, maybe you can't afford to pay taxes, mm -hmm. you can get a reprieve um, for a certain year, maybe if you lose your job. Um, there are certain applications that you can have um, that will allow you to maybe not pay taxes for a year or you'll have to pay them later. Uh, but again, so that there's 45% pay no taxes, 1% is going to pay, or the top 1% is going to pay about 35%, top 10% pays 68% of the total taxes, and the bottom 50 only pay 3%. Interesting. It is interesting. Uh, again, the flat tax is, is not a – again, so this this part here is talking about the progressive tax. Um, the flat tax, though, which some people argue we should have, uh, those people are usually wealthy. 
Um, and uh, they argue, they say that uh, they everybody should just pay the same percentage, no matter what, uh, which would allow wealthy people to have more or to keep more of their money. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so you'll notice in this little chart here that we have um, total revenue. And if you go back to the vocab page, you'll understand revenue, expenditures, and deficit. Um, revenue is just basically what the government brings in every year. Um, expenditures is what the government owes or what we have to spend money on every year. And then the deficit is kind of the difference between the two. Um, and so right now, you'll notice that our national debt is over $20 trillion. Ugh. Ooh. Good luck with that. Ooh. Um, and again, just going, if you want to go back real quick, like the what you'll notice. Oh, sorry. It's okay. Got there it. We, go. we got it. Oh, oh God. No. Oh, it's got it. It's embarrassing. We're got embarrassed. It. We got it. Um, so again, you see like revenues are going to be what we're, what we're bringing in, expenditures, what we're spending. And like, again, this has increased dramatically since the 1980s. Uh, when Ronald Reagan was president, he uh, instituted a lot of tax cuts, um, which meant that the government had to spend a lot more money. And since then, the government has been spending more and more money, uh, and it's just kind of gotten out of hand now. Yeah, I mean, you put in... 9-11, then we get into a war, which cost a lot of money. Then we get into a deficit, which costs us a lot to get out of. Sure. I would wonder, maybe we should we should talk about it in class, like compare the debts to other countries, maybe see how they are. Oh, that is a good idea. That's interesting. Maybe you could research it on your own, students. <laughs> All right. Um, so then we get to um, social insurance taxes, basically talking about Social Security and Medicare. So <clears throat> if you have a job and you look on your pay stub, you will notice that you pay some of your paycheck to every month. It goes to Social Security and some of it goes to Medicare. And those are government um, entitlement programs um, that everybody in the workforce pays into. And then the government provides Social Security um, or money, like income money for older Americans who have retired to help them live out the rest of their life. Um, and then Medicare is um, health care for older Americans again. So um, we all pay into that, um, individuals as well as employers. And that provides for one third of the federal revenue. And that word she said earlier was entitlements, and entitlements have to be paid. Yes. Okay, so there's there's two types of of spending. There's discretionary spending, and then uh, entitlements. And entitlements have to be paid. Discretionary uh, spending does not have to be spent. Uh, the government is just choosing to spend that money. Um, and then the last bullet down there, um, your government really highlights the fact that. Um, as healthcare is getting better, um, and really the birth rate is going down, but it, it, people are living longer. So we in the workforce are paying into the Social Security system, um, and some people are worried that the Social Security, the money that we're paying, might run out because older Americans are living longer and longer, um, and less people are paying into the Social Security system. And so that is a point of debate within government right now as well. I uh, miss Womack and I specifically as teachers we don't even pay into the social security system we pay into something separate that is for teachers um so we won't get social security unless actually if you worked as a, if you if you if anything you pay into social security you will get out um so like I worked as a bartender for example beforehand so did she and uh, so we will get a little bit of social security but we since like you it, it's kind of like a, you get what you put in uh, or you get out what you put in. There right. we go. Mm -hmm. um, so again, we there's a big issue again with the graying of America. We talk about the baby boomers, the biggest population uh, boom in, in history or in America anyway, uh, and so that's still really draining a lot of our resources. <clears throat> All right. So uh, getting into borrowing now, uh, tax revenue does not cover expenditures. So that's a really important thing there is that the money you're making, you can't actually use it for expenditure. So how do you cover those expenditures, Ms. Womack? Other ways. We borrow. We have to borrow the money. So that's what that and that's rough because you're gonna be you have a couple options for that. You can um Buy, like sell bonds to citizens. You can sell bonds to companies, and those are going to be sold by the Treasury Department. And that's literally just a loan that you are giving the government with your money, and you like they will pay you back with interest later. I feel like sometimes grandparents buy uh, bonds, government bonds, for you as you're a little kid. Sure. 
I yeah, they still do I think I have a couple from my grandpa. Must be nice. Yeah. Uh, again, the other thing that th- this is going to be the confusing part is that the government can borrow from itself. Um, so that's a really interesting thing because that adds to the debt, but we are borrowing from ourselves. It's not really a, 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 again. It's a really complicated issue that we'll have to talk more about in class. Um, but it, it it is interesting, and we'll t- we'll get more into those intricacies later. So right now, our national debt is about twenty trillion dollars. Nine um, percent of federal spending are in interest payments, and we have to pay those. That is mandatory. Um, so it's, again, it's just like a bank. When you are, are you if you get a credit card in the future, um, you don't want to spend a lot on it because if you do, the more you spend, the more interest you'll have to pay. And again, the bank wants that interest first. You have to pay that interest, uh, and then you can start paying off uh, whatever you whatever you bought. Uh, something called the debt ceiling. Uh, is that in the vocab? No. No. Okay. Well, I, I, so I'll just tell you what the debt ceiling is. Um, the government is going to basically create a, a bar, and it's going to say we cannot spend, we can't go into any more debt than this number. And so they are in they, now. The, and Congress is making sure that their their spending for that year doesn't go over that level. And that's what a debt ceiling is. Uh, but what we need to know is that spending, government spending, increases when revenue declines. So, like for example, Republicans usually call for tax cuts. Unfortunately, that and so that helps people. However, it hurts the government because the government is making less money. Uh, whereas Democrats will usually raise taxes, but they also will spend more money on government programs. Seems good. Okay, so you will notice on this, we'll just go through this chart really quickly. Um, It starts at 1970. You'll notice that um, we have a slow increase in national debt um, up until about the mid-80s, and then uh, President Reagan issues a tax cut, and then we continue a little bit sharper of an increase. We have another tax cut in er the early 2000s, and then it goes up exponentially from there. Um, remember in 2001, we have 9-11 and then in about 0203, we get into a war, which is going to just tremendously increase our debt. Um, and then we go through a financial crisis. And so if you look here, our debt is not looking good. Well, a lot of people think that we should be able to, you know, I mean, again, as people, we have to balance our budgets Mm -hmm. we have to make sure i mean i guess i guess we don't have to but we have to we we have have to manage our debt you know like if if i if i get too much debt that i can't pay off like i have to go into bankruptcy you know and so that's not obviously that's not a good thing for america to have to do so there's a lot of people nowadays that are calling for american or like the american government to really figure out what's going on with the national debt but at the same time americans still want the government to be providing things for them and that costs money yep Okay, um, so there's a chart on the next slide that we will look at, too, that will give you a little bit more detail about this. Um, But um, tax expenditures. So the government allows for individuals to kind of – what is the word I'm looking for? Uh, um, Deduct. Here, let's look at the the slide at at this first. Okay, so the tax expenditures, uh, like the money the government does not collect, so these are kind of like exclusions, I guess, right. or things that you don't have to pay. Um, so we're what we're looking at is just kind of different different ways that you can kind of save money from your taxes. Mm-hmm. Is that a correct? Yeah, and so if you look at, um, if we go back a slide, so like charitable contributions. When I go and I'm trying to get my taxes done before the April 15th deadline, they say you can um, deduct from your taxes any charitable contributions that you might have made, and the government allows you to get some money back on any kind of contributions that you might that you may have made. Um, same thing with mortgage interest. A mortgage is a payment that I, Mr. Shaw, or myself would make. Um, to a bank to help pay my house payment, okay? Um, So most of the time, I don't know where I'm going with this. That's okay. It's like that. I think here. So what? What I'm looking for, or what you need to know, the most important thing is that these tax expenditures are, are trying to save the public money. Yes. Um, unfortunately, it, it it really is been designed to benefit the wealthy yeah. in, in a lot of different ways. Like I do, I donate clothes to Goodwill from time to time because I mean I don't use them anymore. Um, however, wealthy people are able to make huge, huge donations, like millions of dollars, to to charities, and then they get a tax write off for that, and they have to pay less taxes because of that. Right. 
Right. So I still, again, my nobody cares about my no fear shirt from the 1990s right. that I'm donating to Goodwill. Uh, I mean, it would save me something, but not very much. But when when the wealthy people are doing that, they can. I mean, they're they're going to get significant breaks uh, on their taxes. Same thing with tax reductions. Right. Um, I, again, it, these are really popular with with voters. Americans always want uh, tax cuts for the most part. Um, this is kind of a way to limit the government. The government, it, like we're basically not giving the government as much money. Uh, so they, again, the, the quote unquote, starving the beast. Like if you want government to be smaller, you need to reduce the amount of money they can get. Um, but in, in reality, our debt and, and, and the government has to, that they have to expand when they are, uh, when, when they're getting less revenue from taxes. Right. And so um, that last bullet down there kind of goes back to this uh, chart that we showed you on the last slide that proves that when we cut taxes for individuals or for Americans, um, our government debt just keeps going up because we still have to spend money. A government right. still has to spend money, but they're getting less, less revenue from people. And that goes back into the the entitlements that we mentioned earlier. Yes. Those have to be paid no matter what. Um, here's a chart I referred to earlier. So if you actually, if you notice, the United States is up at the top, and we actually have the um, smallest percentage of taxes in all these other developed countries. Um, now, if you look at these bottom countries, they're going to be more on like a socialist scale where they pay a lot of their income to the government, but the government takes care of health care, um, education. higher education, stuff like that. So it depends on, you know, the system that's set up in each country. But again, Americans, we complain about our tax percentage. But really, if you look at the rest of the world, we have a pretty, it's very pretty small amount. I think it's something in like Denmark, they pay something like 80% or so of their paycheck goes to goes to taxes yeah something crazy it and, is. Like, and like but again they the, like, you really don't need that much money like unless you want to buy like a tv or something they live the, very minimal yeah well Minimally. the government the government's going to provide pretty much everything for right. you all right moving on to section two let's do it federal expenditures again here's your vocab page okay and there's entitlements we kind of been talking about those a little bit um talked about social security and medicare okay so if you want to pause here and write these down, feel free. Um, okay, so federal expenditures. As a government, we have a big government, right? We have a very large country, which means that we have a very large budget. Um, why has the government grown so much? We talked about how much the government has grown um, in the last 50 years. Oh, I mean, More than easy, that, since World easy, War, easy, World easy, War II, 80, maybe. 80, 90 years. Yeah. yeah. Um, so... Obviously, public demand, okay? We expect a lot of our government. We expect them to take care of a lot of things for us, and those things are going to cost money, okay? Changes in the economy, changes in social conditions. Um, people are living better lives now, right? We have higher life expectancies. Um, we, we live healthier now for the most part. Healthier. Healthier. My, my McDonald's visits need to cut down. Yeah. Need to get cut down. <laughs> um, so anyway, changes in social conditions, economic downturns, urbanization, pollution, all of these things are going to contribute to why our government has grown and why our government has to spend so much money on a yearly basis. And conservatives now, like, like a lot of people, like they, they have all, everybody, conservatives for since the beginning of time have wanted smaller government, but now they're like the Republicans and the, and the conservatives now that they, they, they have to deal with a big government. Like there's really nothing that they can do to change the system the way it is. Because people now rely on the government sure. and we can't really take that away. It's just like Obamacare. A lot of people rely on Obamacare for their health care. And it would be very difficult to take that away sure. from millions of people. Uh, okay, so this is just a chart showing you uh, specifically the the federal expenditures. What has been has been paid for again since seventy seven? You see, like the lower uh, part is national defense, uh, and you see that that has grown ever since two thousand and one. Um, uh, and then the next part is going to be the net interest that we have to pay. 
uh, followed by the payments for individuals and then other non-defense. So that's going to pretty much conclude anything else. Um, so the and, and where you see just the how big it's gotten, like these payments for individuals, mm-hmm. um, that's going to so that, that's that, that's the entitlement spending. Mm-hmm. And you see as more people get to that Social Security age, what is it, 65, 66? I think it's 62. 62. Wow. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so that like as more people get that become that age, the government has to pay out insane amounts of money to them uh, because that's what they promised. Like, again, that Social Security started in the 30s. And now all of a sudden, like we're, we're finally reaping the benefits slash really high costs of paying out uh, all these baby boomers. I can keep going. Then the rise of the of the national security state. Um, so what we've what we've noticed now is that um, we have a permanent military. We have a standing army uh, available at all times. It is not it is not a volunteer or I mean it is a volunteer army, um, and that's been pretty kind of. They get paid. They get paid. So um, the since the Cold War, this has really been the case. Really, ever since World War II. Yeah. Well, we used to you know pay a lot for our military during wartime, and then we would cut back that spending. But after World War II, we had to continue the spending because we were entered into the Cold War. Absolutely. And then after that, it just kind of never went down. Sure. Well, now Americans are, are used to it. I mean, again, you, if you talk about uh, – Americans lead the world in two things. Okay? It's defense spending and then uh, the number of people incarcerated in, in our prisons. <laughs> so, I mean, that's a, that's the thing is that people are just used to it now. We we think that we have to spend so much on, on, our, on, the, on our military to keep our country safe and right. – well, I mean, with terrorism, it makes it a lot more difficult. There's right. a lot more unknowns. Uh, so during the Cold War, the Department of Defense spending was half of the federal budget, uh, which is absolutely insane. Wow. But you imagine the fear that was going on during that time. I mean, people were absolutely afraid of their lives, duck and cover, uh, all kinds of stuff going on. So they people were just okay with that. It did go down uh, in the 90s, um, like after after the, after the Soviet Union fell. Uh, but because of 9/11, uh, it has has definitely increased, and it is now one fifth of the federal budget today. And then uh, the military expenses again. We have seven million pensions. Uh, so we have the pensions are for people who have served in the military, uh, and they are now veterans. So we again, they have pensions. Like teachers have pensions. Mm-hmm. Um, that's why a lot of people become teachers. I mean, because it's pretty sweet. Yeah. Anyway, um, so uh, can you, you can you you might know more about pro- procurement. Do you know more about procurement um, than I do? Only that we have certain things that our military has to purchase certain sure. items, and and that doesn't necessarily mean we know specifically every year what they're going to purchase. Sure. But you know, they're just. Um, discretionary spending, you know, and, well, and that you think is going to contribute to the expenses. Right. And you think about like, again, Boeing is a St. Louis based company. Like they, if we need a new plane, we need a new, right. a, a new jet, whatever, you know, that's money that has to be spent. Um, and that's the money the government has to find. Right. Um, and then the last thing is that cost overruns. Uh, these are what things cost more than estimated. Uh, like when you are building a new mm-hmm. 747, I mean, that they wouldn't, the army wouldn't need a 747, but you know what I mean? When you're building a new jet, a plane, um, you have an estimate of the cost and if something happens in the middle and it costs a lot more, I mean, somebody still has to pay that money. Right. Um, so that's a, a kind of an issue with having this national security state and having such an emphasis on our military. Uh, I mean, the money's got to come from somewhere, uh, and there's really no end in sight. Right. Okay, so these are just some trends that we had um, throughout since about the 1960s um, in our defense spending. And see how it's kind of a roller coaster. It's going up and down, up and down. Um, it really drops kind of in the 90s, and then it just goes right back up when we get into the war in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, and so you can kind of analyze this on your own if you want to, but it just shows national defense. Pretty much what we've just been talking about. Right. Um, so then we see the rise in social services. So um, we as Americans, and we've talked about this a little bit already, we expect a lot of our, out of our government. And since our government has been providing Social Security and Medicare since the mid-1900s, um, we as Americans expect that to continue. So um, a lot of what our government spends is on um, – Social Security, it, it attributes to a lot of the revenue, right? Because we, uh, the working force is paying into those, but then the retired people are taking out of it. Okay, so. Um, so you're, uh, I mean, basically everything you 
pay in taxes. Like you, you're basically paying taxes with the, and you're paying into Social Security with the the promise that when you retire, that and you don't have a job anymore, meaning you don't have an income anymore, you're going to get a guaranteed income from the government. Right. And so same thing with Medicare. When you get to a certain age, you'll qualify for Medicare. Um, if you don't, if you didn't retire from a company that provides you with with health insurance for the rest of your days, then you're going to have to go through government a government system, which is Medicare. And again, that is costing more and more and more um, as we go. So the other problem, and we kind of touched on this already, is that there are it's slowly becoming more beneficiaries of these government programs, Social Security and Medicare, than people working and paying into them. So again, because life expectancy continues to increase and because um, we really, the birth rate in the United States has gone down. Let, you know, we're having less babies. So we have less people in the workforce paying into the system um, that a lot of people are worried that Social Security is going to run out and that you know, years down the road, the people who've paid into Social Security their entire lives aren't actually going to have access to it when they retire. Which would be a really big deal. I mean, considering that it's a, it's like I said, it's a promise the government makes you, and if they are going to go back on that promise, a lot of people are going to be without entire retirements. I mean, they're not going to have a single plan. Uh, they're going to have to work for the rest of their life. <sighs> Sounds awful. Ugh. Social services spending. So um, again, this is going to show how much our spending has increased um, since the 60s uh, when it comes to just social services in general. So Medicare and Social Security. All right. So uh, this is a really silly term. Um, that is, that I don't know, some smart guy must have made it. Uh, basically, they, they say that the best predictor of this current year's budget <laughs> is a little bit more than last year's budget. And that, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, is known as incrementalism. Right. Uh, which I think is, it's kind of ridiculous that this is a vocabulary word. But, I mean, it makes sense if you think about it again. Like, hey, wh what's the budget going to be this year, guys? Well, let's look at last year, probably a little bit more. Um, because there's going to be more entitlements, more right. things that we have to buy, things like that. So that's what incrementalism is. Again, so there are going to be some exceptions. Uh, like, for example, NASA, uh, they might have, you know, a one really big year. Maybe they're sending, you know, doing a lot more more missions to space. Um, so they're going to need a lot more money for certain years rather than uh, off years where they maybe don't send as many people out into space. Yeah. Space. Space. Cowboys. <laughs> um, so... Um, sometimes we get into a situation where th we have uncontrollable expenditures. Um, sometimes we can't control exactly what is going to be put into the budget or has to be taken out of the budget. Um, some of it is going to be d because of interest, um, what we've borrowed and what we owe back. Um, and the biggest uncontrollable expenditure expenditures is the Social Security system. I guess because we don't know... I mean, how are we supposed to know how many people the next year are going to be paying into it? Sure. Well, it's and like, it's what all, if people are dying? Sure, because it's all based on like, like again, people who are working at jobs that are, first of all, like taxable by the government, which right. they, which they all are. But certain people might not be working at jobs like. I mean, there's a lot more entrepreneurs now who are working, who are self-employed, uh, and they might not pay into Social Security. Well, and they might get more tax loopholes. Sure. You know, because they own a business. And so anyway, some some expenditures are uncontrollable, and that's just something you need to know. Um, we'll talk more about it later. I mean, it's just not something that is an idea that we're like part of the reason why our debt is as big as it is is because like these things are just getting out of hand. Right. Oh. Let's do it. Okay, budgetary process. <laughs> Again, some really riveting <laughs> vocabulary here. Okay. Go ahead and pause, look through those, make sure you're understanding them. So 13.3 is going to get really, really detailed. Uh, and we're going to do our best to kind of make it easier on you. Um, just, But go ahead, pause it, uh, and get these down, and then we'll uh, we'll go from there. Is it my turn? I don't know. 
Okay, so we're going to spend a lot of time here. Um, let's go ahead and uh, and just, if you guys want to go to page 399 in your book, because these words are a little bit uh, tiny, a little bit tough to read. Um, so that's up to you, though, if you have your book. Uh, otherwise, we'll do our best uh, with this. So the first th thing to start up it, or to think about is the agencies that uh, that run the or that are a part of the executive branch, so they all require money. They have budgets. They have uh, certain needs that need to be fulfilled. Uh, they have so employees, they have to pay. Absolutely. So um, what they're going to do is they are going to send requests to the Office of Management and Budget, and we know from our from our last the last unit that uh, the Office of Management and Budget they are the ones that actually design the budget and make the budget. So they the agencies make requests. Then the budget takes those all into consideration, or the OB, OMB rather, takes all that into consideration, and they work with the president to finalize a budget. From there, uh, the president is going to submit that budget to Congress. Now, but what you, before we move on, you should know that there's a lot of interest groups that are playing, at, they are, are trying to get involved at every step of the way here, but mostly with the president and Congress. They want to make sure that their programs, that their agencies that they support are getting enough money to function effectively in that year. Right. So, for example, the NRA, um, they're going to definitely use lobbying and use any kind of money they can to try to get either the president or members of Congress to create and support legislation um, or create support a budget that's going to be friendly towards their interests. So, you know, guns. I mean, and, and I, I, I'm thinking like NRA, maybe they want more military spending, more okay. defense spending. Yeah, yeah. So like that, they're going to be really like, like making sure that the, the military is well, well supported. Uh, yeah, but it, but it could be anything. It could be like... Oh, the, another like, example is like the NEA, the National Education Association. They're going to try to get more spending on education. education. Or again, environmentalism, stuff like that. Right. There's all kinds of stuff. Um, so that's the first thing. So they're, the president's going to submit it to Congress. Congress uh, is going to go through a, an extremely complicated process, which I'll uh, I'll let Miss Womack take over if you if you want. Okay. Um. So there are like a ton of steps <laughs> to the budget process once it gets to Congress, and they're gonna pick it apart. Well, why don't we just start with uh, the House Ways and Means Committee? Okay. okay. I don't want to do that. You don't want to do that. No. So you do do what you want to do. Well, I just don't really, I mean, I don't care okay. to do any of this. Right. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh. look at the chart. So it's, I feel like it's self-explanatory once you actually get into sure. it. Um, the House Ways and Means Committee, we've talked about this. Um, it is going to be the first step Absolutely. in the entire process. And they're going to make the rules and the procedures or the policies around. I think you're getting rules committee mixed up. Oh, I think so. So Ways and Means, anything that deals with taxes Taxing. has to go through the Ways right. and Means Committee. So what they're going to do is they're going to propose tax code that is going to be subject to the pro approval of the entire Congress. And that's in the House. But in the Senate, they have the same kind of committee, another standing committee. Known as the Finance Committee. But it's committee. the Senate Finance Committee. And they would pretty much do the same thing. Okay. After that, we're going to go to the Congressional Budget Office. Um, they are going to advise Congress on consequences of budget decisions. So again, Congress, they, they basically are going to okay the president's budget. So they're going to look at it like, I mean, we're talking guys like giant, absolute, like huge documents. And they are going to look at it, just take through, take a fine tooth comb, go through everything and make sure that they are, are okay with everything. Um, so anyway, they are going to they're like the budget office is going to advise the consequences. Um, they are going to then advise budget committees, and then the budget committees are going to set the parameters of the budget. They are going to kind of say, hey, we think that this maybe this part of the president's budget needs to be changed, um, or this needs to be added, uh, anything like that. After that, after they've they kind of figured out everything they want to want to be in the budget, um, they're going to go to it's going to go to an author authorization committee, and the authorization <laughs> committee is going to hold hearings <sighs> to evaluate spending for existing programs, and they may propose changes or additions to programs. Uh, this so again, this is all kind of happening simultaneously, but again, focusing like first on kind of getting the skeleton down, and then then you're going to go to the authorizations. They are going to say, hey, these things need to be changed. After that, uh, the authorization committee sends proposals to the appropriations committee <laughs> and the appropriations committee they're going to make decisions on funding for those authorized programs so basically the again think of th think of the words
words. The words are probably the most important. Again, the authorization the committee, they're going to authorize something to be spent or some, some money to be allocated. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the appropriations committee is actually going to appropriate. appropriate Appropriate. Oh, that's not a word. <laughs> uh, they're going to appropriate the money. They're going to give the money to those actual agencies. I think she's mocking me. You guys know why I didn't want to go through this. Eh, we got it. Thanks for okay. doing that. Show, so, so anyway, last thing is that the Appropriations Committee are going to send decisions to Congress for final approval, um, which all of the, the members of Congress actually have to go through. They actually have to vote on it. Um, and then once that happens, uh, well, the last thing, I, I'm sorry, the Government Accountability Office, um, they're going to yeah. basically work as Congress's eyes and ears. Um, they're going to audit, monitor, and evaluate what agencies do with their budgets. This is getting into kind of legislative oversight a little bit. Yeah. Um, so they are going to make sure that every, that their money that they are allocating, they're appropriating and authorizing uh, is being spent appropriately. So after the Congress approves it, uh, then the government can function. Uh. Yes. So again, that entire horrible process that we just went through um, is really important to know because we've had a lot of government shutdowns in the last couple of years. Yes. And so this is a government shutdown is what happens when the government can't agree on a budget mm -hmm. uh, because if you haven't agreed on a budget, well, you can't spend any money. So the military shuts down. Social Security offices shut down. National uh, parks. National parks. Again, no post no, offices. Nobody's getting paid. In a very, again, nothing's happening in the government. The government is in charge of running the country, and the country doesn't get ran. We saw this about a year ago, last December ish, um, and then so it shut down. The government shut down, and then they're like, "Let's approve a budget for like a month," and then they went through the next month, and it shut down again. It was a hot mess. Well, and that's a part of the problem with just Democrats and Republicans are really at odds with each other. No. And uh, they no, there's not a lot of compromising that goes on anymore. No. Wonder if we'll ever change that. All right. Um, so let's get to the president's budget then. Um, the president used to play a limited role until about, I want to say it was the 1920s, when um, Congress actually passes the Budget and Accounting Act. And this act requires the president to start submitting an annual budget to the congress so prior to this um these different agencies kind of ran their own budget and went said it through congress uh, but then congress actually makes the president start to get involved in the entire process so we know that the president prepares his budget with the help of the office of management and budget and they work very closely together um the budget has to be submitted um during February, the first Monday in February is the deadline for the president to get the budget to Congress. Um, and that is for the budget for the following year. Then it's it, the whole the budget process is literally a year in advance. You might think that like the OMB, like the Office of Management and Budget, sounds like they have a really dumb job. Oh, yeah, they just handle the budget. But it's literally a year round thing because they are constantly, constantly. preparing for the next year. Constantly. Using incrementalism. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, so uh, Congress and the budget. We know I want to do this one. Oh. Um, so Congress and the budget. <laughs> um, Congress, we say, has the power of the purse. And I know I've used this term in my classes. I don't uh, know if Mr. Shaw has. I, I might have mentioned it. Okay. So Congress has to authorize all federal appropriations. So whatever the federal government is spending, Congress has to approve of that. Okay, so um, as we get through, we you'll notice that there was a vocabulary term called budget resolution. Okay, and Mr. Shaw is going to take over for this. All right, so budget res <laughs> resolution, uh, again, in the book it says, a resolution binding Congress to a total expenditure level, supposedly the bottom line of all federal spending for all programs. Um, but what's more, what's interesting about that is that once you've set a bottom line, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to follow it. Um, because, again, we have deficits, we have more money. If, if things pop up throughout the middle yeah, of the like year. Yeah, like we have natural disasters that we have to cover. That's a great example. Right? That is something that just pops up and we have to literally send millions of dollars for disaster relief i wonder if they allocate money for that you know i'm sure that's one of those where it's like a uh here's a separate box probably for things that might pop up sure like a, a rainy day fund right literally rainy day and like hurricane sandy yeah too soon sandy sandy was that it that was a long time oh ago. what am i thinking of what was this year what about like michael michael was there a michael i don't know we we're not science teachers Irma? Moving. Was 
Was Sandy the one in Texas? All right, they're going to kill us. We're already at 38 okay, minutes. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Continuing. Do you want to take over? I we, don't we, remember where we, we ended. Already, we already so talked about authorization. We, we really did. We talked about authorization. We talked about appropriations bills. Um, so continuing resolutions is going to be, let's say Congress can't agree on a budget, a final budget, then they're going to allow um, a resolution for agencies just to spend what they spent in the previous year. It's a lot like, again, going back to incrementalism. Like right. they're, like, if they're, hey, we're, we're not able to, to agree on a budget. Uh, let's just go with last year's because it'll be pretty much the same, adding a, a couple couple dollars probably. Right. Or a million of dollars. So we talked Whoa. about, <laughs> again, this is going to be in your book. What page is, is 401? 401. If you guys want to check this out, again, we've really gone over a lot of this. We talked about the players. Um, that's going to deal with a lot of um, your, it's going to kind of cover the main things. This just yeah. really gets into um, what's actually happening, um, like in the spring, fall, right, summer, winter, just the different calendar. seasons. Um, I don't, I don't know. I don't necessarily think that you guys need anything from this. This no. is just kind of showing you um, what's actually happening. What is the, how is the government actually functioning when it, when it go or in regard to budget? Yeah, I mean it's a long process. Um, it has a lot of moving parts, um, and it, and it. I guess it's important to know that it, li you, they start a year ahead of time. Sure. On that next year's budget. I would I would make just focus on the last part where that, where I was talking about the all the different players. I think that that'll cover you for uh, for this 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 slide too. Okay, so <laughs> Uh, uh, again, and we're almost done here. So talking about fluctuating deficits, um, the, again, guys, the deficit is, is money that is owed at the end of the year. And, uh, the part of the reason why we have fluctuating deficits is because of, you know, tax cuts because of, uh, Hey, maybe the government actually didn't spend as much money as they thought they needed to. Uh, so there's just going to, there's a lot of different factors here. Again, as you can see, this, this one is on page, uh, 402. If you guys want to check that one out. Um, there's going to be all kinds of stuff going on. Like in 2008, the financial crisis, uh, the government bailed out a lot of the a lot of major companies that were that were in, in really big financial trouble, mm -hmm. uh, and that's going to be like huge sums of money that they hadn't hadn't prepared to, to spend. Right. Um, so again, you notice right after that, it's going to like the the budget for 2009 was astronomical because uh, because the government had to spend all that money to bail those companies out. Right. Um, and then again, I keep bringing this up, but if you look in the early 2000s, we know that um, we go, we get into a war. Yeah. And that's going to really affect the deficit. Hey, guys. Uh, so we had, like, heart attacks just a second ago because my, uh, my computer died, and uh, it was we, – we almost died because yeah. we had just recorded yeah. 40 minutes yeah. of video and yeah. weren't sure if it was still there. So anyway, we're all done. Um, yeah, this is my life right now. Um, so, you know, don't – Domestic violence is not a joke. I know. Miss Womack. I'm so sorry. Okay. Anyway, uh, so guys, we hope you enjoyed the video. Um, we'll catch you guys in the next uh, in the next episode of the Shawson Womack Show. Yeah. Have a lovely day. Bye, guys.